UMCA has a great vision, a great heritage. For those of us who were here from Monday till Saturday, especially the one that was held, was it on Thursday that talks about the membership? This was very crucial. And it was read to us from the Constitution that the first thing that will, must be noted, especially for anyone to become a member of the denomination, is that the person has accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. In other words, in summary, when he lives, after giving his life to Jesus Christ, it is no longer him that lives, but Christ that lives in him. So it means that he lives as Christ would, you know, live through him. And we were made to understand, especially what and what uh, should the person be involved in in the church and so on and so forth. And what should not be done by such a fellow. All these are tied to the vision of the denomination. And let me quickly read to us UMCA vision uh, statement and mission statement that we have on the program. The mission statement says, UMCA exists to preach the holistic gospel, makes, dis makes disciples through sound biblical teaching, education and training, health services and economic empowerment for the glory of God and service to humanity. So you can see that the mission is all encompassing. So it is not just preaching the gospel, carrying microphones around, but making impact, whether in our offices, whether in school, wherever we find ourselves. What UMCA stands for is that the holistic gospel is preached. Then the vision says, a dynamic mission, an evangelical denomination, that is talking about the identity, with empowered members. Empowered members. The word empower members is broad. And it says, impacting the world as salt and light and prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus. That this, uh, the mission statement and UMCA vision statement, if you read the two and you put them side by side, you will discover that both of them agree together. They agree. One explains better the other. The vision is well explained in the mission. That is how the vision is to be achieved. It's just like you have um, uh, um, an objective on how to carry out a particular uh, work. So God gave UMCA a vision. And he does not just give her a vision. He gave her how uh, the guideline on how to go about achieving the vision. And all these are biblical. When I consider this, and I did a little research into the constitution of UMCA, and uh, I also considered the UMCA anthem, which we are going to sing, I discovered that everything agrees without a minus. And I tried to consider how biblical especially the UMCA anthem, how biblical are the lines and the stanzas? I discovered, I do not know, I'm still researching, to know who actually composed UMCA anthem. But the tune was an adopted one. But the lyrics are so rich 
the wordings are so rich, uh, it explains better what should be our mission on this earth, especially as a Christian. Um, quickly, so that I will not waste our time, I will want us to go through the anthem. After that, then we will come back to the title to see what is God's grace for the greatness he has for his church. It says, we in UMCA have been blessed by the Lord. Jesus laid down his life, but us with his own blood. We are living by faith and the light of the word. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. The first line, it says, we are saved. I mean, we in UMCA have been blessed by the Lord. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Praised be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Then the second line says, Jesus laid down, explaining what kind of blessing God has bestowed upon our lives. Jesus laid down his life, bought us with his own blood. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, the salvation you have is not by your effort. It is because Jesus laid down his life and he bought us with his own blood. The third line says, we are living by faith and the light of the word. So, Jesus did not lay down his life for nothing's sake. He gives us his word. We have faith in him. He guides us by the reason of his spirit. He instructs us and we live by instruction. In Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 12, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And the next line, which is the last for the stanza, says, We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. This is a testimony. Yes, I have given my life to Jesus Christ. I live by faith. In all of these encounters, yes, I have tasted, and I can stand to say that the Lord is good. In Romans chapter 8, uh, or in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, it is God who makes both us and you stand in Christ. And the chorus, that is the refrain, is very interesting. It says, we are saved. Oh, praise the Lord. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So, we are saved not just saved to enjoy life, but we are saved to serve. As we are reading this, please don't forget the background, especially from the passages we have read. It says, saved to serve this needy world. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it was, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, 
not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Then it says, let us spread the glorious gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. He was not ashamed. Let us spread the glorious gospel. And it says, till Jesus comes. So it is not just preaching the gospel for a while. So there is not going to be anything like change of agenda. There is a focus. There is a line. And we must not change. And we constantly do that until Jesus comes. This particular stanza, the first stanza, can be summarized as a testimony of a true member of the church. It gives a better definition of what we are meant to be. We are not just member by paying tithes and offering. We are not just members by attending religious activities in the church. But we are members primarily because we belong to the kingdom. And that is what UMC considers to be a true membership of the church. Then the second stanza says, Jesus gave us a task that is urgent to do. After the testimony, yes, I've been saved and I have everything. Yes, I have seen that the Lord is good. Jesus gave us a task that is urgent to do. I wonder why the composer did not say, Jesus gave us a task and just leave it at that. He said, he gave us a task that is urgent to do. That signifies that there we have a limited time as individual. This place is not eternity. We have a limited time to preach the gospel. And then, when Jesus comes, there will be no room again to preach. The, and let's leave it, especially let's limit it to, to ourselves. I'm a human being. I'm alive today. And this is the time that I can consider to be when it is day. Now, when one grows old and you cannot go out again, when you cannot speak again, is that a time to preach the gospel? No. So the task is an urgent thing for us to do, to go to all the world and preach the gospel. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. Then the second line says, we in UMCA must be busy for him. We must be busy for him. Doing what? Preaching, teaching, and baptizing all people. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Another version says, and this gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Because if you, if you study what Jesus said before the statement, he said that they will be killed. He was telling the disciples, they will torment your life. They will play with your destiny. In quotes. They will do all manner of things against you. But even in the face of all this, the gospel must be preached. And that is what Jesus, I mean, that's what the, the anthem is saying. We must be busy for him when it is okay and when it is not okay. When it is pleasant and when it is not pleasant. We must preach the gospel. Then it says that we preach the gospel and baptize all people who put their faith in the Savior and have turned from their sin. It doesn't say that we baptize sinners into the church. Those that have been preached to and have given their lives to Jesus Christ 
are baptized into the church. And I think um, that is very, very crucial because the scripture says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, whosoever, whosoever believes in him, those are the people that could be. So in other words, you don't just welcome um, somebody who has not given his life to Jesus Christ and baptize such a person. Such a person must have given his life to Jesus Christ. So the second stanza talks about the service or the stewardship of a member or of the church UMCA. And the third stanza says, Christ is coming again, all who truly believe. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, he says, Look, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Jesus is coming again. He is coming again. And the angel said, so shall it be. Amen. Nothing changes it. So those who believe him will be caught up to meet him in glory and joy. And that's what you find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. It says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, he, uh, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. We will be caught up to meet him in glory and joy. And the next line says, may we all from our Savior's side never leave Never leave. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. That we, all from our Savior's side never leave. What do we do then? We are to be his bride. Pure and radiant. Not just an ordinary bride. But a bride that is pure and radiant with love unalloyed. This love it's not the limited love we are talking about. We are talking about the love of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 to 9, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. How? Being pure and radiant. Fine linen bright and clean, was given her to wear. And here, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Praise the name of the Lord. The greatness of God in UMCA is so mighty that one man cannot tell me that he can contain it. All of us put together cannot even contain it. What God has to do, what God, the vision God has is greater than any nation, is greater than any denomination. And this is what I see that UMCA has. 
Now, it means that the greatness that God deposits in a man is not such that can be competed with. It's not such that when the greatness comes into a man, the man also begins to compete with another person. No. Because the work is so great. You do your part, he does his part, and so on and so forth, and that is how we move. It is beyond any human competition. Nobody can compete with the greatness of God. And after all, a competing figure, let's note it, reveals the smallness of his status. And anybody who possesses the greatness of God in him, truly, is not small. In size, he may be small. In terms of education, he may be small. Financially, he may be small. But what God has deposited in him is great. UMCA is great. God has deposited that greatness in UMCA. And if you read the history of UMCA, you will actually know that God is great in the life of UMCA. Many lives that God has used UMCA to transform. And I tell you, many leaders have even lost their lives in the process of transforming many lives. Most of the time, I remember, you know, the burial ground at the center of the college where you have three, you know, uh, people buried there. And I, I think it was at the time that Baba Oloyede was also buried just because, you know, they were running the course of the gospel for the denomination. Some people lost their lives. So that is for you to know that it is not something you can play with. We don't play with it. It's a great work that God has placed on our hands. It's a great service. And if it's a great service, then it means that we need to sit down and do it appropriately.